Did you think your computer screen was frozen? Huh? Because I wasn't doing anything. Thought it was frozen. You're like, play, play, play. It's okay. Here I am. So I feel like I got mask face. You know how like you wake up in the morning, you got bed head? I got mask face. I'm wearing my mask all day. Work the cheeks and jaws. All right. So we have finished Of Mice and Men. So much good stuff to talk about. So we read stories because they entertain us. We read stories because they can help us understand life and our world. They help us understand people better. They help us put us, they, uh, stories put us into situations that we ourselves might not ever be in. But then we can start thinking about the world from that perspective. Again, that's why I love stories, why I love reading, because we can experience entire lives, entire cultures, entire uh, worlds that we would otherwise not know about at all. So um, we finished Of Mice and Men. I hope that you enjoyed it. But from a literary analysis perspective, there are things that we must discuss because critical readers, these are things that you as developing literary students need to be aware of. So let's start with symbols, okay? A symbol is always a thing that it is, and it always stands for another thing. Now, the story is Of Mice and Men. A lot of students think the story is going to be about mice, and there's just not really much in the way of mice in this book. We started with the poem. We'll hit on that in a little bit. Uh, the wee slick at cowering timorous beastie, ah, with the panics and the breastie. Remember that one? Okay. So, symbols. The mouse is a mouse, and Lenny picks up a mouse at the very beginning of the story. And George is like, what do you got in your hand? He's like, it's a mouse. A mouse? It's just a dead mouse. Get rid of that dead mouse. That's it. That's the only mouse in the entire story that we see. So what's going on with mice? Well, think about it. What does Lenny like to do with the mouse? He says he likes to pet it while he walks along because it's soft and he likes soft things. So the mouse is a mouse, but what else is it? It's the soft things. And why does that matter? Because he likes to pet soft things. So we have the pup and Lenny gets the pup and Lenny is in love with the pup and he just holds the pup and he doesn't want to be away from the pup and he likes to pet the pup because it's soft. Now, when we're thinking symbolically, think about the dog. What happens with the dog? So Lenny pets the mouse now, he said he found it dead, but it's still dead. He pets the pup, and then he bops the pup on the head and breaks the puppy's neck. So, it's the soft puppy that Lenny accidentally kills. What is that symbolic for? What happens? Oh, I guess I don't have the slide in here. I thought I had Curly's wife up next because it should be Curly's wife. Why? Because Curly's wife hair is soft and he pets her and she freaks out and he breaks her neck, right? The similarities here are very, the dog doesn't represent Curly's wife, but they're so similar. It's almost symbolic. Lenny pets the mouse. The mouse is dead. Lenny pets the dog. The dog dies. Lenny pets Curly's wife, she dies. So critical readers, you might have started to notice the pattern as we went through the story, and you might have been able to guess, mm, he's petting her, things that he pets dies, right? So you might have had an idea of what's going on. So symbolically, mouse kind of represents the pup, the pup represents Curly's wife. All right, next up, the farm is a farm. They want to get a farm. They want to physically own the property and the land, the animals. But what else is it? It's their dream. It's their hopes. From the very beginning, we see that George and Lenny talk about a story that they've talked about many times before. Remember, it says George's voice took on this rhythmic quality as though he's told this story many times before. They talk about the ranch. They've got all the words. Lenny knows all the lines, right? 
he interrupts George and George goes, why don't you say it? You know the whole story by heart. You know our dream by heart. You know our hopes by heart. So the farm is a farm, but it's also this hope and this dream. When Candy enters into the story and Candy's like, hey, I got a bunch of money and your dream sounds really nice. Can I get the farm with you? We see that connection of the farm and the dream. So yes, it's about the land, but it's so much more than just the land. It's about having that, that hope and that dream of something. And they say it quite clearly, a place to belong. And when a friend comes along, they could stay at our farm, but they can stay in this great little place that we have. Okay. Um, okay. At the very last part of the book, we get this weird thing going on. And Lenny is sitting there and he's waiting for George. And the rabbit hops out of Lenny's brain, it says. Well, the rabbit's not really there. And the rabbit talks in Lenny's voice. Remember, the rabbit says, uh, you ain't fit to lick the boot of no rabbit. So it's a rabbit, but what else is the rabbit? Same thing with Aunt Clara. Aunt Clara comes out and she comes out of his head and she starts talking in Lenny's voice. What the heck's going on? Okay, so yes, the rabbit is Lenny's conscience and Aunt Clara is Lenny's conscience. Lenny's brain is smart enough to recognize he's done an unforgivable thing. He's done something so bad. He's killed a person. Now, here's the thing. Lenny also is so concerned about George. And right, he's, as he's talking to the rabbit and he's talking to Aunt Clara, he's saying he's sorry and he's afraid that George won't let him have the rabbits anymore because the rabbits are also a part of that dream and that hope. And that's what Lenny's clinging to. We want to get the rabbits and a place for ourselves and a place to live and a place to belong. Okay, let's talk about the games, the card games. So on one hand, George plays solitaire and it says George lays out his solitaire hand and he's playing solitaire by himself. Lenny, doesn't have the mental capacity to play card games. In fact, when he picks up the card, he looks at it and goes, they're the same both ways. Why are they the same? But Lenny doesn't understand how the cards operate, how to use the cards. Um, so symbolically here, what we got going on is this idea of solitaires for one person. And even though George has Lenny, there's still a, a big gap between George and Lenny. There's still this big understanding gap to where they can't actually do things together on that level. So um, George plays Euchre with Wit. And I know you probably don't remember Wit. He was a pretty tiny character. And they lay out the hands, but they don't actually play the game. And I think this is important because George never makes that connection with anybody. He never actually plays a card game with Slim. He never plays with Wit. He never plays with Carlson. He doesn't play with uh, Lenny. George is still kind of on his own. The games represent that, that, that solitary element to things. George has Lenny, but George is still kind of on his own, just like a parent. A, 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 particularly a single parent, right? The parent has the child. The parent loves the child. The parent takes care of the child. Sometimes the parent gets angry at the child, but the parent and the child can still have great love for each other, but they're still never quite equals. They still are never quite on that same, that same playing field, that same level. So the card games are definitely in there symbolically, I think, to highlight this idea of aloneness. All right, so let's talk about themes. Themes are the author's message about life. So now we're talking about John Steinbeck. We're talking about the message that Steinbeck wants you to know.
If we take away George, if we take away Lenny, if we take away Carlson and Crooks and all these other characters, what ideas are we left with? And so let's look at the ideas that come up again and again and again. So here's one of them. Candy says that he's worked all over and he's uh, helped with a lot of people with crops, but he's never had his own land. He's never had his own crops. Crooks says, nobody gets to heaven. Nobody gets no land. It's just a dream. It never happens. Crooks says, I've seen lots of guys come to work here. They all have the same dream. They want to get some land. It never happens. George and Lenny, it says this dream that they'd always had, but never really thought would come true. It was going to come true. It was going to happen. And now we come back to the poem, Robert Burns' poem, To a Mouse, where it says, The best laid plans of mice and men gang off the giggly. Remember? The best laid plans often go wrong. Things get messed up. So even though it was this dream that they had that was about to come true, they could make it happen, it doesn't. It doesn't happen. You guys, is Steinbeck being positive or negative? He's being so negative. Steinbeck is saying, look, people, you might have hopes and dreams, and hopes and dreams are good, but it's not going to happen, he says. Oh, you got this sweet dream. You want these good things to happen? Nope. It doesn't happen. Does it happen for candy? Nope. Does it happen for crooks? Nope. Does it happen for George and Lenny? Nope. Nope. The whole point, and it's depressing. It is a sad thing because so much in life, you're told by parents and teachers for years, if you could dream it, you can make it happen. Make your dreams come true. Your dreams are your reality. We say all these really nice, loving, good platitudes, these lofty ideas, right? If you want to be president, you too can be president. You're not going to be president. Chances are very small that you're going to be president. Right? You want to be an astronaut? Eh, probably not. It's just, it might be a good hope and dream and it might be really nice. It might even motivate you. But the truth is, not going to happen. And you're like, dude, Steinbeck, come on, man. That is a harsh lesson to learn. That is, that is tough. And Steinbeck's like, yep. Try shooting your best friend in the back of the head sometime. Life is hard. Your hopes and dreams can be good. Your hopes and dreams might motivate you, but they're not going to happen. Ouch. When we started, we talked about the idea of the American dream and how we had this idea that uh, if you work hard and get a good job and get a good education, you can afford to buy that house. You can afford to buy that nice car. You can afford to get married and have a bunch of kids and have a nice, easy life. And some people do do that. But for a lot of people, it's just a dream. For a lot of people, they can never actually make everything come together to make it happen. And so I think Steinbeck is really challenging us here. He's challenging our idea of the American dream. He's saying, look, dreams are good and we need dreams. Sometimes life just beats you down. Dang it. Okay, so now I'm going to comment lastly here. That last line of the book is Carlson saying, now what the hell you suppose is eating them two guys? And it's, it's just like, what? Why would you end like that? I think the purpose is this. George and Lenny have each other. And now they don't. And now George is alone. And Slim... Slim says to George, George, I get it. I know what you had to do. It was the right thing. And that was a hard thing. And Slim says, George, let's go in. We'll go to town. We'll get a drink. You can get drunk. You can try and forget this. But this was a hard reality because you had somebody. You had a friend. And Carlson's like, what do you think's wrong with those guys? Huh? Why are they so sad? Carlson didn't care about killing the dog. 
Carlson doesn't care about killing Lenny. Carlson doesn't understand connection. He doesn't understand that concept of connecting to another human being, which takes us to our next point here. Takes up to this point here. We'll go back to the next one in a little bit. All right. We see consistently throughout the story, George and Lenny say, I got you and you got me. We can look after each other. We go together. George and Lenny, Lenny and George. We go together. And the other guys around the farm are like, wait a second. You guys like go around together? The boss asks. Curly says, wait, 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 wait. What are you getting into it for? Why do you care? You go around together, huh? Is that it? And Slim's like, you guys go around together, huh? Hmm. Interesting. Not many people go around together. And then Crooks drops the hammer and Crooks says, a guy gets lonely and he gets sick. So what other lesson is Steinbeck telling us? One, hopes and dreams, they just don't happen. But two, you got to have somebody in life. You have to have a true, dear friend. George and Lenny were true, dear friends. And nobody else had that and nobody understood. Look around you in your life. Who has a true, good, real friendship? A lot of us might have one or two really good friends. Sure, we might have 5, 10, 15, 20 friends, people that we're friends with, people at school that we say, hi, how you doing? But how many of us have a real, true, deep friendship? Not many of us. And I think Steinbeck is saying, look, you have got to have somebody because if you don't have somebody, you get mean, you get sick, you, you, you get to hating everybody. You become like Curly, who just hates guys. He just wants to beat them up. And Curly doesn't care about his wife. And Curly's wife doesn't care about her husband. And they completely have no connection at all. And Steinbeck's saying, that's not a good way to live. That's not good. Get somebody, hold somebody, be, be true to somebody. We can say love here. Now, when it's coming to George and Lenny, we're not talking about romantic love. We're talking about platonic love. A love that goes between deep, dear friends. And I think Steinbeck is saying, look for that true, deep, lasting love that friends can have. Because that's good. That's going to be very good and very meaningful. All right, I, I skipped over this one. Let's go back to this one. Uh, I asked in one of the Ed puzzles here about why do you think George wants to sleep down by the river at the very beginning of the story? He says, I like it here. Okay. We know that the ranch is just up the road. They could walk to it. And if they did, they could go have dinner. Instead, they just warm up some beans. And Lenny's like, but if we went there, we could get dinner. And George says, no, we're going to sleep here. I like it here. I got my reasons. Well, what are George's reasons? Well, what does George hope for? Having his own place. When a ball game comes, heck, I'm just going to go to the ball game. When it rains, we'll just stay inside. What does George want? George wants to be the master of his own life. He wants to be in control. He says, yeah, there's thrashing machines, which means tomorrow, all we're going to do all day is pick up 50-pound bags of grain and throw them on the back of a truck all day long. Bend over, pick up, throw, bend over, pick up, throw. He's like, that is exhausting back-breaking work. We're going to bust a gut. We're going to be so tired and exhausted. But tonight, we are kings. This is our castle. We choose where we sleep, and we get to look up at the stars, and we get con to control our own lives in this brief moment. And I think one of the messages here that Steinbeck is trying to tell us is that sometimes we just have to be able to live our own lives even if it's for a moment. We all long for that control over our life. We all want to do what we want to do in our lives. So I think that's one of the other themes here. So one of the themes is this idea uh, of um, your hopes and dreams. They just don't happen. 
The other one is a friendship. Find yourself a true friend. This other dream here is about sometimes it's good to be in control. We want to have that control in our lives. Maybe that's, you know, tied up with the idea of hopes and dreams. But the whole point George is going after, this whole idea that George wants is to have his own place, to have a place where he can belong, to be in control of his life. Okay, uh, so I think that takes care of that. That. All right, now let's talk about Curly's wife. Why does she have no name? Steinbeck clearly picked out people's names, right? We've got George Milton. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Lenny Small. Not small. Curly. Curly hair. Crooks. Crooked back. Slim. Slim build. He's, you know, nice and skinny, right? We got these names that clearly are connecting to the characters. And Steinbeck goes, oh, I don't know any women's names. Uh, I won't give her a name. <laughs> no, of course not. I think Steinbeck doesn't give her a name because when we look at Curly's wife, she is associated only by him. Look, it's an apostrophe. And what do apostrophes show? They show possession. Curly owns his wife. Curly possesses his wife. There's no relationship there. It's ownership. To Curly, it's his thing. He only wants to have a pretty toy to play with. And when his pretty toy gets broken, he's not brokenhearted over the loss of his true love. He is angry because someone broke his toy. Slim says, Curly, maybe you better stay here with your wife. And he goes, no, I'm going to get him. I'm going to shoot him in the guts. Curly is upset over the breaking of his toy, not over the loss of his wife. So I think one of the things Steinbeck is doing here is showing this woman as a possession, which is terrible because ladies, you are way more valuable than just a possession. You uh, are important individuals with important uh, hopes and dreams for yourself. Curly's wife had her own hopes and dreams. She said, I could have been an actress. Maybe I will be an actress someday still. She said, I could have been in Hollywood. I could have talked into the radio and gone to the big movie premieres. She had hopes and dreams. And yet, she stuck with this guy. She lost her personality. She got wrapped up in somebody else's identity. And she lost her own identity. She says, why can't I talk to you guys? Nobody talks to me. Every time I come in, you all run away. I'm not doing anything wrong. And I think that's just Steinbeck once more just saying that, uh, that loneliness becomes a disease. She gets mean when it comes to crooks because she's lonely. Uh, so anyway. Curly's wife has her name because she's just a possession. She's just a thing. She is not seen or viewed as an important individual. Nobody sees her for who she is. They only see her through her husband and the connection she has to him, which is sad because she doesn't get to be her own person. All right, imagery, and we've talked about this before. The story starts with these golden hills, starts by the river, and it ends, same place. It starts and ends at the same place. But if you look at the beginning of each chapter, each chapter does not begin with dialogue. It begins with a description of the setting. Chapter two starts with a description of the bunkhouse. And remember those apple boxes that are nailed to the wall? And then chapter three begins again in the bunkhouse, but where the, the light, the lampshade hanging, and that light being cast on the table is very specific. Chapter four, it starts in Crooks' room, but we get so many descriptions of the sounds of the horses and the things that are laying about Crooks' room, the books that it has. Chapter five, we're in the barn, and we get the beautiful description of the barn slats. And you can see here in this picture, the light coming through the barn slats, and you can hear the clang of the horseshoe on the metal stake outside. And then 
it ends right where it begins. And so you get this idea that Steinbeck is drawing you in every chapter. He's saying, come, be here, exist right here, because I'm going to make this world come alive for you. You can see and hear everything. And it's just a wonderful way to start every chapter. Good critical readers will notice that pattern. They will notice every chapter starting with that same kind of imagery. And Steinbeck's inviting you into every chapter. He's making you feel a part of that world. All right. The last thing I wanted to talk about here uh, is just kind of a little bit for fun. Um, we've talked about the great conversation. We started our year off by looking at a couple of the Bible stories. Um, so I am not the first one to come up with this theory. I think it's an interesting theory. I think it's a fun theory, but I don't think we have to do a whole lot with it. But uh, if this idea is this idea of having a dream and then losing a dream, let's take a look at some of the connections we might have to the Garden of Eden. So if you remember, Adam and Eve are in the Garden of Eden, God's perfect place. And the serpent, a snake, which we have symbolically here, the devil is the serpent. And he tricks Eve, he deceives Eve into eating the uh, forbidden fruit. And because Adam and Eve eat that forbidden fruit, they are kicked out of God's garden. And they lose that, that wonderful thing. So think about it. It starts down by the river in a garden and ends in a garden, right? Ends in the same place, not actually a garden, but symbolically, same kind of, we got those, those hills in the background and the trees. If you are paid attention, there was the snake in both the first and the last part of the chapter, periscoping its head above the water as it swam through, right? So we get the symbolism of the snake, which might be the serpent. And of course we get the temptress, Right, Eve ate the fruit first and then told her husband, Adam, here, eat this. And Adam's like, whoa, God said we shouldn't eat this. So you might have Curly's wife representing Eve as this temptation. And why? Because Lenny is tempted by her. He says, I'm not supposed to talk to you. And she goes, what's wrong with talking to me? And he goes, I'm not supposed to be with you. She should have left. But then she's like, no, I'm friendly here. Feel my hair. And he's like, oh, that's soft. And he gets drawn in. And that's where the sin comes. That's where the breaking of things comes. You take the temptation and it breaks things. What happens to Lenny? Because he broke her, drawn into that temptation, Lenny is now exiled from the garden. He is kicked out of the garden. George and Lenny are there. George kills Lenny. Lenny is removed from the garden. Lenny is removed from their hopes and their dreams. The Garden of Eden is this perfect hope of wonderful living. Their hope of the farm is this perfect hope of wonderful living. And she tempted Lenny, and now it's broken. The last connection, which probably helps to draw it all together, John Milton is a very famous writer who wrote the story Paradise Lost which is a very old story, but very famous. And it essentially is the story of uh, the devil falling from God's grace. He was in heaven. Now he's been cast down to earth. And Paradise Lost is this eternal struggle of good versus bad, heaven versus hell. And what is George's last name? George Milton. John Milton wrote Paradise Lost, George Milton, right? Steinbeck picked names, Lenny Small, Curly, Crooks, Slim. Like these names are not accidents. So I don't know. It might not be all that important, but I sure think it's a lot of fun to talk about. I think it's a lot of fun to think about. And good critical readers, we, we, we grab onto these little nuggets and we pull them together and we go, hey, is there something here? Is this exciting? That's fun to talk about. So that's how I wanted to end. I think I've kind of covered all the big things real quick. Um, 
So, ladies and gentlemen, I love teaching this story. I hope you enjoyed hearing it and experiencing it. So if you have questions, please email me. If you want to have comments, let's make sure we share them. All right, ladies and gentlemen, take care. Have a good day.